forward and Hello, we're here with Senator Joe Wynn, who is running for King County Executive. Would you like to go ahead with a two minute introduction? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm Joe Wynn, the state senator from the 34th Legislative District. I am the son of immigrants. I'm the first Vietnamese state senator in the history of Washington State. I'm also the first person of color to ever represent the 34th Legislative District. And the reason why I said that is because I believe that representation is incredibly powerful. And if you look at this last legislative session and the previous couple of legislative sessions, we've passed some transformative policies here in Washington state. Things that we've been fighting for for a long time, cap gains, police accountability, climate change, funding the working families tax credit, funding childcare, TANF, increasing investments in basic needs programs. And it's largely because we have people at the table who are impacted by policies. People who, instead of, having to amp instead of having to fight to make sure their voices be heard, are now at the tables being uplifted and amplified. And that's the power of what we can get done here in Washington State, but also in King County, when you have leaders who reflect the values and the future of their area as well. So thank you so much for having me. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we'll go into the prepared questions and I'll post the first one into the chat. And I believe Jeff was first on this one. Uh, would you like to go ahead, Jeff? Uh, the responses will be two minutes apiece. All right, uh, so the county executive often must build consensus with the city council, the cities, and the state. Uh, where have you found the opportunity for consensus and where do you see the opportunities for improvement? Yeah, funny, funny uh, anecdote. After I announced, uh, there was a reporter who is generally known for being more conservative sent out a tweet mentioning that it was interesting that I was jumping in. And in fact, despite being one of the more progressive members in the legislature, a lot of Republicans like to work with me because I've been known to be no BS and also would rather focus on getting things done. And where it's manifested itself very well has actually been in police accountability. I worked on a bill, Senate Bill 5055, as it relates to law enforcement discipline and police arbitration, two incredibly contentious topics all in one. And through hours and hours of conversation with stakeholders from impacted families, uh, police uh, representatives, and also community members and labor leaders, we actually passed a bill that was fairly bipartisan, one of the more bipartisan bills in the legislature. So there is an opportunity for us to work together to create positive change. And what's interesting too, is that the vast majority of bills in Washington state are in fact bipartisan. And it's important to make sure that you live your values, but you'd be surprised at how much you get done just by talking to people one of the examples actually was when some of the local jurisdictions uh, made a decision about homelessness that I didn't actually agree with. Instead of just flaming them online, I went ahead and called a bunch of the local electeds in that area. And it was very eye-opening to see kind of why they came about to those decisions. And oftentimes when you make decisions as a leader, it can't be top down. You have to lead from within the community and it goes a long way. So I do believe that even if you dis disagree with somebody, you have to be able to at least talk to them and we found some success doing that as well. And if you hear my son in the background, it's <laughs> he's doing his thing. 20 seconds. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, uh, question number two, I'm adding that into the chat and uh, I believe it's Carrie. Hey there, um, how would you advocate for alternatives to incarceration in the county's criminal legal system? And how would you make zero youth incarceration a reality in King County? Very good question. And thank you so much for asking that. Because if we are uh, focused on zero youth detention, I don't believe building a bigger jail would have been the right route. In fact, one of my first bills in the legislature was actually uh, to divert youths from the legal system. Being able to have law enforcement give them the opportunity to go to a community, community, or community program instead. What's interesting is that in Washington state, we do have statutes that require us to have some sort of mitigation as it relates to juvenile detention or juvenile justice. I'm sorry, it doesn't have to be detention, um, but we can do that in a more humane community focused ways. Uh, one of the first bills that I worked on as well was Senate Bill 5290 as it relates to the DECA bill uh, in relates to truancy. So oftentimes, instead of giving youths the opportunity to be successful, we've criminalized them in the past. Back in the 80s, we used to spend uh, the same amount of money on human services and basic needs as we did on our legal system. Because of the war on drugs, which has failed, now it's four times as much on the legal system as it is on the basic needs programs. We need to fix the systemic problems 
that cause uh, our youth to get in trouble in the first place. Also, there are very racist and biased laws that are in the books that we need to address as well. So one of the bills that I was very excited to, to work with uh, Representative Johnson on this past year was uh, House Bill, I think it's 1440, where if a youth uh, is, a, is in contact with law enforcement, they are given the right of legal counsel. They have to have legal counsel. So in my mind, we need to fix systemic issues as it relates to the situations in which uh, we cause this type of harm. We also need to make sure that seconds. we take, now he's throwing, he's throwing things. Uh, now we also need to make sure that we, we <laughs> fix some of these bills. And then we need to have a more humane approach, more community facilities and diversion, like choose 180 and others. Sorry. <laughs> like okay. It's quite all right. Uh, you have quite the focus there. Uh, I would not not be able to do that. Uh, here's question number three. Uh, Sarah. King County needs further investment in health and human services. What increase in health and human services would you prioritize? How would you fund and implement these increases? Yeah, really, really good question. And what's interesting is that the budget should be a moral document. And that's kind of what we did at the legislature this year. And King County right now of the $12 billion budget, about half of it actually goes again to, to the criminal legal system versus everything else. Um, especially important for King County is behavioral and mental health as well. So some of the things that we feel are the root causes for, for instance, uh, homelessness, I believe need to be augmented and funded. Part of that is that 1%, um, sorry, the, the percentage of the sales tax that is being used for homelessness and affordable housing. I think that is a great improvement. Candidly, the tax structure for the county is fairly limited, especially given some previous initiatives that caps how much you can raise in property taxes as well. So one of the important things that you have to do is that in order for us to effectively have these services for our communities, there needs to be a partnership with the state and the federal level as well. Again, trying to bring it back a little bit, but one of the things that we passed at the state level is an increase in what's called TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. When I was a young kid, we were very poor. After my dad got into his car accident, uh, left us in a pretty bad spot. So some of these basic needs programs are what we relied on to be successful. And if we want to truly solve systemic problems with homelessness, behavioral and mental health, we have to address that as well. So uh, candidly, we, we have to fix some of the, the funding models within the county right now. Uh, honestly, across the board, so whether it's transportation, uh, whether it's um, uh, otherwise, we need to make sure that we address those. 30 seconds. But, but being able to prioritize these investments, I think we can actually reduce uh, the cost of other aspects of the county. So right now, instead of investing and alleviating poverty, we're criminalizing the effects of poverty and the crimes associated with it. If we're able to invest in basic needs, I don't think we actually need to have an additional amount of increase in terms of the budget itself. We can just spend it better. Great, thank you. And question four, Nicole. Yeah, if elected, how will you use your position to promote racial equity and advance an anti-racist agenda? Would you decrease the King County Sheriff budget and if so, by approximately what percentage? Do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? Perfect. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful question. It'd be hard to answer in just two minutes because I'm very passionate about all of the parts of it. Um, so the first thing is that racial equity is a verb, not a noun. This is something that we have to actually do. Uh, what I get a little bit frustrated by is that oftentimes people in leadership will make performative statements about the need for racial equity. And instead, they will just either rename the street or do something performative. We need true justice. And true justice means investing in our communities, whether it's land transfers, uh, addressing Welsh uh, disparities, economic insecurities, investing in communities that have been uh, historically been left out. So when we talk about being anti-racist, it needs to also include investments in communities that have been specifically excluded from our ec economic systems, including uh, unincorporated areas where I'm from, where we're seeing rapid gentrification. So that's one. Um, the King County Sheriff budget as well. I do think that we spend too much money as a whole in our society on the legal system, on our law enforcement, and it should be instead be more put towards uh, diversion programs and more, more towards human services programs. Uh, candidly, oftentimes um, the, the law enforcement side spend time uh, basically doing what's called pretextual stops or, or minor traffic offenses. Uh, I would actually move that out of law enforcement into more of a civilian type of function. Uh, in Berkeley, they're working on something right now where they're taking those uh, what's called pretextual stops or minor infractions like expired tabs or tents, stuff like that, 
out of the police department into unarmed uh, enforcements where they don't necessarily interact with police in that capacity. So we can shift the role of what that county uh, sheriff officer is going to do. The other one, I had a, a bill with Senator, I'm sorry, with Rep. Newland Tai to end qualified immunity with law enforcement. Obviously, that's very tough. Uh, we got the arbitration bill passed. We didn't get that one passed. Certainly very supportive. Have been working with, with legislation on it as well. It's called civil immunity in Washington state. Uh, qualified immunity is a, a federal level. But yes, I do support it. And there is a bill that was in the works that we worked on that will hopefully uh, get going for, get for next year. <laughs> Super short for a tough topic, but there you go. There's the cliff notes. Had like one second to spare. There you go, and I'm punctual. <laughs> Uh, so now we're going to move into follow-up questions and the uh, responses, the response link, links to these are one minute piece. And look, we'll go to Summer, then Sarah. So I know that we've asked a lot of questions asking you to like kind of stake out your positive ideas and thoughts on everything. But I also wanted to give you an opportunity to make the case about why you rather than your opponent to us. Yeah, I, I think... First off, I had talked about representation earlier, but candidly, uh, we need leaders that have the integrity, uh, passion, and lived experiences of those who've been impacted by failed policies, because that's when you see people fight with an urgency to fix those same problems as well. And as we recover from this pandemic, whether it's COVID or racial inequities, we need leaders who reflect the values and the future of this county to get it done. And in my short time in the legislature, obviously I know a few of you, uh, I've proven that we can get things done because we don't really have another option. People in our streets are dying right now. People that I care about in our communities are suffering. So in my mind, we need leaders who understand that, that pain and is willing to channel that into positive 15 action. seconds. Great, thank you. Sarah, then Barbara. Now, this question is from our environmental caucus in the 36. How would, have you worked to combat climate change and promote climate justice? And what, how would you use your office if elected to ensure King County drastically lowers net carbon emissions by 2030 and achieves carbon neutrality? And if you could speak specifically to things that you would do that the county isn't already doing. Oh yeah. Well. Honestly, all the bills that we just passed this legislative session, the county isn't doing yet because we just passed them. So a lot of the initiatives at the state level has to be implemented at the county, whether that's the Clean Energy Transformation Act, whether that's the new cap and invest, whether that's clean fuel standards, uh, whether that's phasing out styrofoam, all that stuff has to be implemented at the local level, which I'm very excited to, to fight on. One of my first bills in the legislature actually related to increasing standards for uh, cars in Washington state. And it's funny because it was low key. Uh, nobody noticed it, but we, and we, we phased out internal combustion engines uh, and nobody noticed <laughs> with that bill. So I love that kind of stuff, mainly because in our, uh, in our, in Washington state, 44% of emissions is in the transportation sector. So if we seconds. want to tackle it, we have to go there. One of the other bills that I worked on, another huge emitter in, trans in, in Washington state, buildings. So I also worked on being able to make buildings a bit more efficient as well. Um, and, and beyond just emissions, but also taking care of our environment, the wastewater treatment facilities need to be managed appropriately so we aren't spilling sewage into our pristine Puget Sound as well. And <laughs> proposals and opinions in, in one minute. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so um, Senator, my my question is actually an exact follow on to your last sentence. So I'm interested in, I'm, in, I, I, I'm a practicing landscape architect in Western Washington and King County has the distinction of being one of the biggest polluters by virtue of lifestyle choices, by what people do in their yards and by what people uh, into Puget Sound and by what sort of drains drip, drip, drip into the um, sewage system. And it's way, way, way too expensive to replace, to separate sewage. So we have, we, we have, um, we have the possibility of changing people's choices of what they do on the land in the county. And it will take leadership. The only way to do it is by leadership. And I'm interested in hearing you relate to that and talk about it. 
so funny. Uh, I think we may have met and talked about this topic before, but my, my sister is, yeah. A, <laughs> yeah. so my sister is a civil engineer and literally her job is water diversion. So I happen to know a little bit about this stuff just at family dinners and whatnot. And that's one of those low key government county level functions that people don't appreciate, but impacts literally all of our lives. I mean, if you have a, a bathroom, it impacts your life. If you have a sink, it impacts your lives, right? And in Washington state, that's why um, we've had issues with the wastewater treatment facilities because I don't think it's been prioritized enough. And the fact that we're just now asking for funding to help update these facilities, even though spills have been happening for the past two decades, kind of speaks to the mismanagement of how that's happening right now. Um, water diversion. 15 seconds. Very, very important uh, in terms of Seattle made it required to have water diversion, uh, water for diversion treatments on your properties. We can do that throughout King County. And I think it's not just uh, the right thing to do. It's environmentally conscious and it doesn't have to be too expensive. Also, how we think about gray water is also interesting as well. I know Corporate King County has Vashon. They want to use gray water for a whole host of things, uh, diverting it, but also using it for positive things in their landscaping and otherwise. That's my one minute response to something that I do care very much about. We can talk about industrial symbiosis. We can talk about using <laughs> water waste from one area to make it um, used in another area. Like the way we treat water can be transformative if we do it right. Great. Sorry, I'm okay. probably went over. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, go ahead. I just have a follow-up question. I really appreciate your leadership on criminal legal reform. And I think no, no one in the 36 wants to see kids in jail, but there are currently laws on the books, laws that can only be changed by the legislature, as you know, not the exec, um, that do require sentencing and incarceration of youth that commit serious offenses. So regardless of whether or not we like it, right? So my question is, what specifically would you have done differently um, as opposed to you know, the option of the youth jail? What is that? kind of more humane community fo focused approach look like to you? Yeah, 100%. I think you're referring to the Juvenile Justice Act of 1977, I believe, and it was updated in 2004 or so. And in that it says you need to have a system to deal with juvenile offenses. It didn't actually say you had to build potentially a youth jail. It's just a system in order to mitigate it. And especially given the fact that, you know, at, at that point, I think it was about 80 or so uh, youth overnight. And right now it's about 20 or so. Uh, the volume isn't as high as you would think to warrant a $240 million facility. So in my mind, we already have examples of community facilities in Washington State. In fact, the Department of Corrections does some stuff for graduated reentry, um, where you place uh, currently incarcerated individuals into community-based, community-based, which I believe is the key, smaller facilities that are much more humane. Because if you treat everybody like a criminal, it is no surprise that then they react in a certain way. There are examples in other jurisdictions, there are examples here in what those community-based uh, facilities look like, but I believe it needs to be smaller, it needs to be community-based, and it needs to be humane. That's what I would have done different. Great. And probably been cheaper. <laughs> any further, any other follow-ups? I'm very passionate about that topic. Sorry, I, I, I've <laughs> dug in a little bit uh, in terms of what we would do different. Um, but yeah, not here or there. Sorry, I see a hand. So that's okay. Mackenzie. I want to like just have. I want to have like drinks <laughs> and just talk about this stuff all night. I know. I know. Or, Mackenzie, or go ahead. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Um, you were one of the first people to try to bring universal basic income um, kind of uh, to the forefront in the Seattle area, at least in Washington State. And while that didn't go very far, I'm curious if you have. Thoughts on trying to um, push the different cities that will be under you if you uh, get elected to this position? And also, if so, um, how to fund something along those lines? It actually went further than you think. The reason why I put that bill out there was because um, I fully believe in giving cash to people who need it the most because it helps lift people out of poverty. Uh, because of those conversations, I, I was trying to move the conversation further left. During that same time, we were able to increase funding for TANF, uh, brought it back to what it was beforehand, increased it by 15%. We funded the working families tax credit as well, and we've increased funding for basic needs and diversion programs. So technically not a, a universal basic income, but it is a pseudo basic income for those who need it the most. And I saw Tacoma is now uh, working on a pilot program as well. Uh, mayor Tubbs or the former Mayor Tubbs of Stockton, California happens to be a friend of mine. We've talked about this. 15 seconds. And I've talked to even Andrew Yang about it as well. But I do believe that we need 
uh, to make sure that people have their needs be met because systemically that's also part of the problem that we see as well in our society is when people don't and the, and the outcomes as such. So for me, it's, it makes sense um, for a whole host of reasons. And that's why I push so hard on my basic needs programs because it's like a pseudo basic income and nobody notices. Great, thank you so much. And uh, we are out of time. Would you like to go ahead with the one minute wrap up? Yeah, thank you so much. And again, I'll reiterate kind of what I was saying before, but at this moment in time, I think we need leaders uh, with the integrity and passion and the lived experiences of failed policies who will fight with the fierce urgency uh, to fix these problems, right? And because I came from unincorporated King County, because I was raised by a single mother who didn't have access uh, to healthcare, who didn't have access to other things, we relied on this community uh, to, to save us, essentially. And I believe that we need leaders who will fight for the future and for the values of the people here and who will make sure that we prioritize people uh, before politics and before profits. And thank you so much for having me today. Thank you.